Thank you. We're very happy, or I'm very happy to be here representing our division and the work that we've also been doing with the Center for um, Educator Leadership as well. And this is really, it's uh, cross-divisional work in, in many respects. Um, but today I'm going to speak to you about measuring student growth and um, some, cre hopefully some ways to do that that can be responsive to your needs. To begin with, though, I want to tell you a little bit about how the Division of Assessment is trying to reconceptualize how we think about assessment in a broader sense. So we've really been, um, for many years, we've really been the large-scale assessment um, folks, those dealing with the required state assessments in, three through 12, in grades 3 through 12, and we're really trying to broaden that perspective as we think more about balanced assessment. And so we're really trying to redefine assessment as the process of collecting and interpreting information that can inform educators, students, and parents and guardians about students' progress in attaining knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behavior that can be learned or acquired in school. And that leaves us open to looking at a variety of things that, that, we, that can't be measured as well in just large-scale assessment. When we think about that in terms of assessment and evaluation, we want to think about a system that uses multiple and varied measures of student performance to provide more valid and reliable evidence across time and to measure the influence that educators really have on student growth. We really want to think about a form of assessment that demonstrates meaningful application of essential knowledge and skills. The Illinois Administrative Code Part 50 establishes the minimum requirements for valid and reliable performance evaluation plan for certified employees. And all of these resources in the PowerPoint that will be linked for you have, have um, the linkable, clickable links, is what I'm trying to say, as well as a resource page that can take you directly to all of these resources throughout. If you haven't read the Part 50 rules, though, I would highly encourage you to do that. That is going to be your most reliable source of information for those of you that have questions about the requirements for PARA for evaluation of certified staff. I am going to walk you through, though, a few of the critical definitions that you'll need to be thinking about as you think about student growth in this context um, for the purpose of teacher evaluation. Within the Part 50 rules, there's reference to a joint committee, and that's the committee that's comprised of equal representation between the district and its teachers, or when and when applicable, the bargaining representation of the teachers. <coughs> the size of that joint committee is going to vary based on the district size because you have to have that equal representation. So in a very small district, that means that that co joint committee is going to be much smaller. What that, that doesn't mean, though, that prior to the joint committee starting to meet, that you can't have other meetings before that official starting date with more representation. It's also important, though, that you know that because you may be a group of teachers that are less likely, or a group of administrators that are less likely to be represented on that joint committee if you're not advocating for yourselves. When we look at the definition of assessment under Part 50, it's any instrument that measures a student's acquisition of specific knowledge and skills. Assessments used in the evaluation of teachers, principals, and assistant principals shall be aligned to one or more instructional areas as articulated in the Illinois Learning Standards. Note that it is any instrument. So that leaves it pretty wide open, and we'll talk more about the types of assessments that are outlined in the definitions in a little bit. Student growth, as it's defined, means a demonstrable change in a student's or a group of students' knowledge or skills as evidenced by gain or attainment 
on two or more assessments between two or more points in time. And this student growth shall represent at least 25% of a teacher's performance rating in the first and second years of a school district's implementation, and after that, it will be 30%. Now the performance evaluation plan is going to identify at least two types of assessment for evaluating each category of teacher and your joint committee is going to decide on what those categories of teachers are. One or more of the measurement models to be used to determine the student growth specific to each assessment that's chosen. So your joint committee has a lot of responsibility in setting this all up. The measurement model that's determined is, go, is meant to mean the manner in which those two or more assessment scores are analyzed for the purpose of identifying a change in knowledge or growth or skills over time. Now when we think about that broader de definition of assessment within the rules, it's boiled down to three specific types. A type one assessment is a reliable assessment that measures a certain group or subset of students in the same manner with the same potential assessment time items and is scored by a non-district entity and is administered either statewide or beyond the state. These are, for the most part, going to be your large-scale assessments, your highly standardized assessments. In WEA MAP, ISAT, to give a few examples. A type two assessment is any assessment that's developed and adopted or approved for use by the school district and it's used on a district-wide basis for all teachers in given grades or subject area, really for whatever that category of teachers is defined as. But this type two assessment can be any type of assessment. It could be a commonly developed assessment as long as it's used by all teachers within a certain category across the district. The type three assessment is any assessment that's rigorous and aligned to the course's curriculum and that the qualified evaluator and the teacher come to agreement about determining that it measures the student learning in that particular course. So a type one or two assessment can qualify as a type three assessment if it aligns to the curriculum being taught and it measures the student learning in that subject area. A type three assessment can really be any type of assessment so long as the qualified evaluator and the teacher agree that it aligns with what the course is teaching. Now the evaluation plan must include the use of at least one type one or type two assessment and at least one type three assessment. In addition, the administrative code states that each assessment used for a data point model may be different provided that it addresses the same instructional content. That means you do not have to use the same pre-test and the same post-test. The joint committee has to identify the specific type one or type two assessment to be used for each category of teachers. So again, those, the equal representation, administration and bargaining unit employees. And the evaluation plan shall require that at least one type three is used for each category of teachers. However, if the joint committee determines that there is not a type one or type two assessment for a specific category of teacher, then two type three assessments can be used. So this may occur in areas that are commonly not tested areas. Um, for example, I, I was a music teacher and very often there was not one assessment being used district wide for music because I was the only music teacher for that grade band. And so I guess by virtue, you, by virtue of that, you could have said it was both the type two and the type three because I was the only one in my category. Um, but more than likely, that would have placed me in a position where the joint committee would have said I would have had two type three assessments. If you're in a district with a smaller program, 
with a limited number of teachers in the grade band that you're serving, that may also be true of teachers in your area. You may only have one teacher, and therefore they may be two, in the situation where they would have two type three assessments. What we're really trying to emphasize here is that the goal of the performance evaluation plan is really to choose measures of student growth that help to improve teaching and learning. This isn't about gotcha. This is really about using what you have to improve teaching and learning. So I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to spend the remainder of the time really talking to you about this process of student learning objectives and how that might help you to do that in the area of early childhood. The student learning objective process is really just that. It's not a measurement model in and of itself. It's actually a detailed process that's used to organize evidence of student growth over a specified period of time. It's taking what you do in the classroom day in and day out and putting it in an organized template to show that progress is being made. It what we've put together is a template that contains questions and statements to guide teachers and evaluators through the process of measuring student growth for the purpose of performance evaluation, but honestly, it's a great teaching tool. It's a great professional development tool, and it scaffolds the conversation that a teacher and a qualified evaluator can have. It contains five elements, a learning goal, assessments and scoring, growth targets, actual outcomes, and finally it results in a teacher rating. It runs on a cycle. And the cycle's grouped like this. Elements one, two, and three, the learning goal, the assessments and scoring, and the growth targets are laid out at the beginning of the process. The actual outcomes and the teacher rating are at the end of the process. In between there, at step four, you'll note a midpoint check-in. This midpoint check-in is designed to be a point where you can take a look at the data that's been collected that that far into the process, and you can realign those targets because the goal here with the SLO process is not to get to a point where you're rating teachers on how good their prediction skills are, if they're mind readers or if they're able to look in a crystal ball and predict how much growth is going to be made because we know that each individual student is a different creature and they're going to develop at a different rate it's really to take this structure to look at the growth that's, growth that's being made and to realign and to think about the instruction, the instructional strategies that we're employing, and to do what we do as teachers day in and day out and adjust those to fine tune them as we need to for each individual student and then move forward with new goals and new outcomes if we need to towards the, you know, looking toward the end of the year or the final product that we're expecting. That midpoint check-in could be done one-to-one -one with a qualified evaluator or what we're seeing in some districts that are out in front um, in doing this is that they're meeting together with teams of teachers on a professional development day and those teams of teachers are looking at the data together which is really a powerful process and they're saying, this is what I'm seeing in my data. What strategies do you think I could employ in the classroom to move me forward? And their coworkers are saying, well, here's some things I'm trying and here's, here's what I would suggest and this is what, if you tried this, this is where I think you could take this child. This is what I think may work. Here, here might be a better goal to strive for. What the research has actually shown is that teachers are 
equally likely to be over ambitious in setting targets as they are to be under ambitious. And I think it's really important that we bear that in mind, that this is a learning experience for everybody and that we really need to stay focused on students as we're working through this process. And that midpoint check-in is critical to making this an effective process. So what actually goes into this template? Well, first off, a learning goal. And a learning goal is really that description of what students will be able to do at the end of a specified period of time aligned to appropriate learning standards. This is probably gonna sound eerily familiar. I mean, it's really like a unit planning or a, a lesson planning template. The development of this learning goal is gonna provide the solid foundation for what follows. We're suggesting that this learning goal may include one big idea. And th there are a couple reasons for doing this. One is just that that big idea can integrate multiple content standards and link units of instruction together. Now, why would we suggest that instead of limiting to such a narrow point in time? Well, from an assessment standpoint, and from a standpoint of gathering data to help you have a, you know, to help create a more fair evaluation, the more data points you have, the more valid and reliable that data is going to be. So if you create one big idea and then you collect data, multiple data points over time that can connect to that big idea, you're gonna have the opportunity to, uh, to account for changes over time and you're not going to be basing a decision on just two points in time um, where a student may have had an on day or an off day on either of those times that you looked at them. You're gonna have the opportunity to look at that child on multiple typical days. If the big idea chosen is representative of the most important learning in the typical student growth in a content area grade level or your classroom, um, then that's really going to be helpful because again, you're gonna have the opportunity to watch that type of growth day in and day out because it's what you're doing in your natural environment, in your teaching. And this is really important too. You cover multiple big ideas in a year or in any specified block of time. For this SLO process, for the evaluation process, you're only gonna focus on one of those. You do not have to create an SLO for every single big idea that you're instructing, unless you just really wanna do that. Um, if, you're in this, if you are doing two type three assessments, it might be a good idea to use two SLOs. I mean, that might be the route that you wanna go. Or even if you're doing a type two and a type three, you may wanna do one group SLO and you wanna, may wanna do one SLO. That may be the process that you want to use, but you do not have to create one for everything that you're doing. Here's an example. And there is, I believe we got uploaded a full SLO example template um, for you as well. But here's one example. You might have a learning goal that's demonstrating emerging knowledge and understanding of the alphabet. You could align that to some standards. And I'll carry this example throughout. When you move to the next step of assessments and scoring, then you would wanna look for something to align to that. You don't want to recreate the wheel, but here's the thing. You want to start, start with the learning goal first. So often, um, at, at least from the large scale assessment standpoint, we start with the assessment first, and then we end up in this, with this mindset or this paradigm where we're teaching to the assessment. We want to start with the learning goal that's most important first. And then we wanna find the right tools to measure the learning goal. We do not wanna start with the assessment as being the end of the line and deciding that all of our instruction has to match the assessment. We wanna start with what's most important first, which is what do we really want kids to walk out of here knowing? And then as we move to the assessment, what we'd really suggest is what are you already doing in your classroom? What observational tools are you already using 
to get this information? How do you know when a child has mastered the big idea or the learning objectives and the standards that you've identified as being most important? In some cases, that answer may be a common tool that you have at your disposal. In other cases, that may be something, that may be an aha moment where you say, wait, I've been doing something in my classroom for years. I've been tracking the growth of students this way. I've just never thought of it as an assessment tool. I've never thought of that as an assessment. I've just always, I've just always done this. In fact, um, you know, I mentioned I was a music teacher. I've got several colleagues in the assessment division that are also have a music background. And so when we heard, when they first started calling this non-tested grades and subjects, we got a big laugh out of that because we said, how do you teach in the fine arts without assessing every single day? I mean, that's, that's all we did as fine arts teachers was assess. So this idea of non-tested was, Yes, we weren't standardized assessment, but we were constantly assessing. That's the only way you get an in-tune chorus or a band that can play together. You have to be doing that. I think the same is likely true of you. You are constantly assessing the students that are in front of you. It just doesn't look like our colleagues in high school. So what assessments and scoring procedures might you use? There are guiding questions and statements within the template that can help you with that. You may want to use things like work samples, rubrics, photographs, checklists, same kind of things I suspect many of you are already using. How are you going to show that those work samples are going to demonstrate growth over time, though. You need some sort of a measurement model to put that all together. What we're suggesting is, is an example measurement model that is very simplistic. It does not take a statistician. It really is just another organizing structure. We're suggesting that you collect baseline data. And baseline data you're going to start at the beginning of the year, or in your case, from when a student may enter your programming, which could occur maybe not in the traditional sense at the beginning of the year, but at any point in the year when that student comes into your programming. And it's going to include things other than perhaps academic data. You may do parent surveys. You may do student surveys. Basically, what you're trying to gather is any information that's going to help you think about what's appropriate for this student moving forward. Again, the same sort of information you'd want to collect to think about how you're going to best provide instruction to this student anyway. Step two is an optional step. It may mean that you're grouping students together based on some of the baseline data that you've collected or some things you know about these students if they've been in your programming uh, for a number of uh, years or for some period of time. You could also do this just with individual students. And I'll show you a sample in just a moment. Then you're going to determine growth targets. And remember, you're going to have that midpoint check-in to realign these targets. These are differentiated according to your, those starting groups that you've either uh, created based on that data or individual students. Then at that midpoint, you're going to re-examine and you're going to ask yourself the question, do these targets that I've set, do they need to be adjusted? And finally, you're going to document how many students actually met those growth targets. So here's a basic, a very basic example. 
this does not show this does not show an example where students have been grouped together. This is an example of how you might do it if you just listed out all the students in your class. You would just put them according to the classification. So this could be a rubric that you created around the data that you intended to collect. Here are where the targets were. So basically in this example, they're all moving over one. And then in the end, what you would do is you would record what actually happened. That would be that final step, what actually happened, and that then would become the discussion that you would have with the evaluator, which would then lead to the rating. And the rating would typically be based on, and this is something the Joint Committee could agree on, but typically that rating would be based then on what percent of your students actually met their targets. We have online modules and a facilitation guide that are posted on the balanced assessment webpage. There's a link to that later. This actually breaks down the process. I've gone through it very, very, very quickly because I know we're running short on time. This actually breaks down the process into 10 or 15 minute modules that go through each individual step of the SLO process as well as the para um, part of the presentation. There's also a facilitation guide that would give you points at which you could stop those modules if you wanted to have a discussion with your joint committee or with groups of teachers. You could stop and start it and have specific questions for conversation. Um, that example, SLO for early childhood, is out there. I also wanted to take a moment, though, to point you towards some other resources that may help you with the performance side. So that was the really fast overview on something that might help you with the student growth portion of it. But this website, and this is also in the resource links, um, has a wealth of information about some research that's being done to provide examples appropriate for early childhood around the Charlotte Danielson work. And there's a direct link, again, in the presentation that will be uploaded to the site. I'm going to skip forward really quickly, and then I'll come back here for just a second. I'm going to tell you that um, Diana Zaleski, who works in our, with our area, is um, very helpful around the SLO process. She has been out working with a number of districts and a number of areas. And she actually did a workshop with some early childhood teachers earlier, I started to say earlier this summer, that was a long time ago though, um, in June. And uh, had we got some great feedback about how this process could be used to really help some conversations. In fact, the, the feedback we got the most from that group was that this was the tool that they had been looking for to really strengthen conversations and particularly to um, make the work that they're doing in their classrooms very a way to make the conversations about their work resonate with the other educators that they worked with in other grade levels or other content areas and their administrators that may not understand what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis. This was a way to organize what they were doing in their classrooms and say, here's how our students grow from time to time. Here are the sort of tools we use to um, look at student growth, to assess our students. And that was very powerful. So reach out to Diana if you have questions. I also want to point out um, the balanced assessment link is the top one. The second link on here is a new piece of guidance that PIAC just released um, last month last month or the month before. It is some additional guidance for teacher evaluation that deals with special education, English learners, and early childhood. I think that resource may be helpful as well in thinking about evaluation. 
Part 50 code. Um, Center for Assessment SLO Toolkit, our SLO model is based on the Center for Assessment work, so you'll find that most of their resources align very closely to what we are doing. Um, at the very bottom is the link to the teacher evaluation in early childhood classrooms, the screenshot that I shared a couple of slides back. I tried to um, go through that very quickly to save some time. I think that you may have, um, I tried to hit on the questions that I saw that you submitted early. I think you were also collecting questions on note cards throughout the session. So we will, if, if there were additional questions, we'll be happy to get those answered and posted back up for you or you can contact us directly and we will answer additional questions for you. Is there anything else that I can answer on the fly real quickly? I know we're sh really short on time, but I'm happy to do what I can. Yes. So you're talking about using a value-added model, a statistical model to do that. Okay, so you, those are typically being used in larger districts or, or smaller districts that have joined together to create because that's a, in order to meet the assumptions, you'd have to have a large enough student population. Um, more than likely, then, you would have to use some sort of a standardized assessment in order to collect the data. So um, the first thing to look at is do you have that? for your use. Um, most places that are using a value-added model have already contracted with somebody to run, to run that model. And you would need to make sure that whatever assessments you are using uh, would, you know, would fit into that model. Those would be the decisions that the joint committee was, was making. Each of those models are, well, those models are proprietary, so when you contract with somebody to run that model, that specific model, it's been, it's been designed around a specific set of assumptions, and you would have to, you know, you would have to know if you were meeting, meeting all of those. So I think that would be a very, indi would have to be a very individualized type of answer. We can provide, though, on that balanced assessment site, there is um, one of those modules is about different measurement models, you might check that out because it does give you some questions to ask about the specific measurement model. So if you have concerns or questions about a particular measurement model, that gives you some, some questions just to raise. Is this the right model? Will this help me? What sort of results should I expect from the model? Mm -hmm. All right then. <laughs>